is indeed a day that God has made. Let us then rejoice and be glad in it. And let us count our many blessings. Let us be grateful for the capacity to see, hear, feel, and understand. Let us be grateful for the incredible gift of life. And let us be especially grateful for the ties of love which bind us together, giving dignity, meaning, worth, and joy to all our days. In the spirit of life and love and laughter, let us consciously lay aside today our often reflexive thoughts that presuppose so much, that divide and break us into so many pieces, that keep us from honoring the common hopes and dreams and needs of all humans. And in doing so, let us, in whatever way is our own personal congenial way, to reveal ourselves to the world with charity, with humor, with words that heal, words that transform, words that invite a smile in someone or a thanks or simply relief for being accepted by another. In the name of that which is to each of us of ultimate concern, amen. The You know where I got the title of his sermon from, right? It was taken from the Wood Brothers song, Little Bit Broken. And I like the lyrics, the ones that stand out for me is that the more I live, the more I know I should wear my scars like medals of gold. Everybody is a little bit broken. And it's all right <laughs> to be a little bit broken. A true story, the year was 1998, and Rita Bass Coors of the Coors Beer family was attending an auction for the hospice of Metropolitan Denver. Going once, going twice, sold for $7,000. The auctioneer announced the winning bid as his gavel hit the table. Rita was elated. She had just won a unique porcelain mask hand-painted by the beloved late singer, John Denver. She could hardly wait to take it home and add it to her collection of John Denver memorabilia. As the auctioneer hands her the covenant mask, it slips from her grasp and to the horror of those in attendance, falls to the floor, shattering into dozens of broken pieces. What once held great value was seemingly brought to nothing in an instant. Now, I would have asked for my money back. <laughs> but she didn't do that. Even though $7,000 was probably more like seven cents for a Coors heiress, but Rita simply picked up the pieces and took them home and, and placed the broken pieces around a memorial she had constructed for John. So our theme this month, as you may be able to gather, is brokenness, which I define as the condition in which something is so badly damaged that it ceases to function correctly. Some of us still have the, that childhood memory of the time when our favorite toy broke beyond repair. Then, as we grow up, we realize that just like inanimate objects that can be broken into many pieces, our lives can be broken too, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Some say we're born into a broken world full of broken things, broken backs, necks, and bones, broken windows, birds with broken wings, people with broken spirits, broken hearts, 
and broken homes. And when I speak of broken people, these broken people make up broken families, broken organizations, and broken societies. They establish broken systems, thus proliferating broken, brokenness, which perpetuates further divisions, inequalities, injustices, animosity, and deeper suffering. When we look at it, divisions and brokenness often lead to more divisions and still deeper states of brokenness. As a minister, I am often invited into people's lives during the most, their most challenging moments of brokenness, times of loss, addiction, abuse, illness, fractured relationships, either as a result of our own decisions or from factors beyond our control. Every one of us at some point faces moments of vulnerability, disappointment, and failure. And 2 Corinthians 12, 7, and 10, the Apostle Paul writes of having a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know what illness he had, but, but we know that he prayed for healing. But despite pleading with the divine to take it away, what he heard the divine say was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So even Paul himself, who wrote most of the New Testament, experienced brokenness so I guess indeed everybody's a little bit broken it may be impolite of me to ask but just how broke are you <laughs> pain is a shared human experience and we all have the scars to prove it and some of these scars linger long after the pain has subsided. They're reminders of what we've been through and what we've gone through, what we've suffered. Now, some of us are ashamed of those scars and would rather cover up the brokenness because it reminds us of a far too painful past where we think others might reject us if they were to see us in all of our raw, naked brokenness. Millions of dollars are spent annually on various attempts to conceal our emotional and physical scars, sometimes even from ourselves. Yet these scars remain present and can show up when we least expect it, causing pain and confusion in both us and the ones we love. In many instances, the deepest wounds are those that are invisible, like spiritual or religious trauma which often reside at the core of our being. But I'm here today to convey to you, your scars don't have to remain hidden. There is healing and hope available. Indeed, beauty can be found in your brokenness. The Japanese art Kintsugi that was talked about in this morning's story for all ages is the art of mending broken pottery with gold or other precious metals, which embodies the philosophy that broken objects once repaired can possess even greater beauty and value. Not by restoring the objects to its original state, but by transforming it into something new. The inference here encourages us to highlight our imperfections, the broken pieces of our lives, which we would normally discard away with the trash, but rather highlight them as a thing of value, or shall I say, as beauty marks. And understand that sometimes it is in being broken that we truly discover our worth. The new thing of value exists not despite the brokenness, but because of it. What if we could view our brokenness, our scars, as enduring symbols of our resilience, renewal, and connectedness? Might we live fuller, more authentic lives if we were to stay connected with our inner selves, embracing our past wounds along with the insights? they bring yeah 
John Mark Green wrote, beautiful are those whose brokenness gives birth to transformation and wisdom. Every broken piece of our lives, each scar has a story attached to it and a lesson to be learned. Some of these stories are painful, while others are not. Some are filled with shame, while others are a source of pride. So maybe you were able to find love again after a failed relationship, or you recovered after a bankruptcy or a difficult diagnosis, or you refused to repeat the childhood abuse that you endured, but rather you chose to overcome it. Somehow you made it through. When others thought you should have given up, you persevered, you hung in there. One of my scars stems from the fact that my father never told me or showed me, not even once in my life, that he loved me. In fact, I don't think he ever spoke those words to any of his children. So I'm very intentional with my daughter about telling and showing her that she is loved. And I chose to forgive my father by accepting the words he never spoke. Because perhaps he did feel love for us, but simply didn't know how to show it. We all must forgive both ourselves and others for the missteps along the way. Our wounds will remain open and oozing if we dare to refuse to forgive. This is a major part of our becoming something new. And above all, we must love. Love unconditionally. Love through the pain. Love in the face of fear and doubt. For it is love that ultimately heals all wounds and mends all brokenness. Folks, if love is a remedy and antidote to brokenness, then we need to be about love's business. I said, we need to be about love's business. We may not be able immediately to heal all the brokenness of the world with our love, but this should not diminish our efforts. We need to keep on loving the hell out of folks. Despite how they show up in the world. This is the essence of our aspiration to love beyond belief. It is to see and honor the beauty in, in each other's brokenness and to bind individual broken pieces into a community. And we do this with the pure gold of our authentic presence, the sacred conversations that we must have, along with the acts of kindness and generosity and the strength of our shared humanity. This is how we get it done. Now, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the times when beauty is hard to find and recovery is not an option. Sometimes the mess is beyond mending, the hurt beyond healing, the brokenness beyond repair. Our limbs may be amputated, we may lose our sight. The cancer may metastasize. We and our loved ones may not survive. Yet, amidst all of our loss and struggles lies the power of choice. The choice to ascribe value to what remains in the aftermath of all our battles with brokenness, scars, and the elusive beauty of our existence. Although Miss Kors picked up the broken pieces of the porcelain mask she won at the auction, they weren't put back together. She didn't repair the mask. Rather, she accepted the broken pieces as they were. And the value was what she alone placed in them. Margaret Atwood stated, in the end, we all become stories. It's a poignant reminder of our agency in crafting 
our own narratives, despite or perhaps because of our wounds. Some wounded individuals often find themselves shackled by the ghost of what should have been or what could have been, but this can stifle their ability to move forward. They are ensnared by the illusion that life is to be free of loss, failure, or injury, and we know that's not possible, right? But we allow our minds to trick us. Wounded individuals often find themselves shackled, but they can be set free. Maria Robinson insightfully remarked, nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. This perspective isn't merely about moving past our brokenness, but about transcending it. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4 and 9 that we may be perplexed, but we are not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. This verse reminds us that our brokenness does not define us. Rather, it is a state from which we can rise, transformed by the grace of the divine, that source that sustains us all. While we may never reclaim the future we once envisioned before our trials, we have the unique capacity to reimagine the path we're on. Our stories, folks, are ours to tell. The beauty we seek then becomes not a quest for what was lost, but a celebration of what we have found in its stead. Unwavering resolve to forge a new narrative of hope and possibility. When beloved All Souls member Rocky Stegman, courageous battle with cancer, was nearing the end, a spark of hope shined through the overwhelming sense of despair. Rocky was a cherished professional at Channel 6 for a number of years and a well-known and well-loved persona in the community. His deep connection with his partner, Robin Ballinger, demonstrated the power of love and commitment, even in facing life's fragility. In Rocky's final days, he and his family received exceptional care, kindness, and compassion from nurse Kelly Scott and her team at St. Francis Hospital who held them and guided them through each stage of the dying process. Kelly also attended to Rocky's young sons, Zach and Evan, with understanding and comfort. She went as far as counseling and staying in contact with his family in California, who was also struggling with accepting his pending death. Robin remarked, Kelly made the experience beautiful. Profoundly touched by the support and empathy from Kelly Scott and her team during this most difficult of times, Robin was inspired to honor Rocky's legacy by giving back. Robin recounted reaching out to Kelly, asking if there was anything needed at St. Francis or if she knew of a way she could give back. Well, said Kelly, I have a dream. I dream of creating a sanctuary for those at the twilight of their lives, a place for people who can't keep their loved ones at home due to exhaustion, the presence of small children, or or the lack of understanding about death, or for the many people who don't have the resources for their loved ones to remain at home. Robin told her how beautiful of an idea it was and that she wanted to help. And thus, a dream was put in motion. Among the first to seek solace within its embrace was Helen, whose husband could no longer care for his sick wife at home. Then another person came, and then another and another. Initially, it was housed in a modest three-bedroom apartment, But in response to the community's needs, it quickly expanded to a second apartment, ultimately leading to a a capital campaign and efforts to build something more permanent. 
And through relentless dedication, communal efforts, and the generosity of multiple donors, and a united vision of what end-of-life care can look like, land was purchased, and construction began. And then around the year 2000, Clare House was fully realized. A peaceful refuge designed to offer families a place to come together to learn and find comfort as they navigate the inevitability of their loved one's death. Born from brokenness, from the brokenness of Rocky's passing and a persistent dream of caring for the most vulnerable, Clare House has flourished into a legacy of beauty, a place where many of our church members have spent their final days, including our beloved ministers, Reverend John Wolfe and Bishop Carlton Pearson, who died last year. Clare House is an example of the impact that our lives can have even beyond our time on this earth. That even in brokenness, others can be inspired to repair, to mend, and to dream. A testament to the profound beauty that can arise from brokenness. Indeed, my friends, it is our brokenness that makes us truly human. And it is our brokenness that enables us to connect with others on a deeper level. Why? Because we can relate to one another's struggle. Because we can support and help each other heal. So let us honor our shared brokenness and the resilience it reveals. Finding beauty in our imperfections and unity in our collective journey toward wholeness. Bound by the golden threads of our humanity. So let me end with the words of Laura Jean Truman. Keep my anger from becoming meanness. Keep my sorrow from collapsing into self-pity. Keep my heart soft enough to keep breaking. Keep my anger Turn towards justice, not cruelty. Remind me that all of this, every bit of it, is for love. Keep me fiercely kind. 